Welcome to Trauma-Informed Parenting, where you can find information about adoption, foster care, parenting a child with a capital letter syndrome, such as ADD, ADHD, FASD, SPD, on the spectrum, etc., and trauma-informed parenting, all in one place. I'm Kathleen Guire, your host, mother of seven, four through adoption, former National Parent of the Year, author, teacher, and speaker, but more important than any of those things, I'm a parent just like you. I know what it's like to raise kiddos with trauma histories and capital letter syndromes. I used to feel as if I were the only one struggling, and because I felt that way, I isolated myself. I don't want you to feel alone in your parenting journey. So grab a cup of coffee and join me for Trauma-Informed Parenting, a Coffee Break Podcast. Hi, Kathleen Guire here. Welcome to this episode of Trauma-Informed Parenting. Today, I'm going to talk about three tips for investment parenting with co-regulation. I'm going to start with a little story from a friend of mine, Susie, who is a foster and adoptive mom. She shared this conundrum with me. She was teaching the four-year-old Sunday school class, and she had this little new kiddo who melted down and hid under the table the whole time. She had no special instructions for this little one, and she wasn't sure how to handle it. She later found out that this little one was a foster child and had just been placed in the home just the evening before. And the point is, there is a big difference between disobedience and a reaction based on past trauma. So if you can put yourself in this kiddo's shoes and imagine you're in a new home with weird people, and yeah, we're weird to them, these foster kiddos and adoptive kiddos when they first come home, And everything is different, and then Sunday morning you're taken to Sunday school class and you're expected to regulate and color and recite a Bible verse or whatever else is going on. I could really do a whole podcast on taking a fresh foster adoptive placement to church, but I will save that for another day. So let's move on. The Signature of Trauma Children with trauma histories or capital letter syndromes have altered brain development. Now, if you're wondering, like, I thought you were going to talk about investment parenting. I am, but we need to get this foundation first. We need to understand why the kiddo needs the investment parenting, why they need that co-regulation. The main outward sign of past trauma is often what we refer to as, in quotes, bad behavior or the inability to self-regulate if you want to sound more sciency and less critical, which I prefer because when a kiddo has had trauma, then they can't regulate, just like the kiddo in the classroom, the Sunday school classroom, hiding under the table he was probably scared to death and he could not regulate in this new environment. Too many new things, too much sensory overload, too many changes in his life very quickly. And this is why I'm leading up to this. The truth is when it comes to behavior, we must remember that every behavior expresses a need or you probably heard me say this. If you've been a regular listener There is a need behind every behavior, and I did not come up with that statement. That's from Dr. Karen Purvis, and she taught that, and it's revolutionary. We have to, and I'm sure other scientists teach the same thing, but as parents and teachers and counselors and therapists, we have to remember that. In fact, on my podcast, when my daughter was on, Audrey, if you missed that one, that is a great one to listen to because she is raising six neurodivergent children. And that was one of the big, instead of tips that she wanted to harp on or speak about was 
remembering that there is a need behind every behavior. And sometimes the need is they want to control, like maybe they want to run out into the road and you're thinking, okay, that's not safe, but their need is, I need to feel like I can do this thing. So anyway, I'm getting off track, but let me go back. So, like I said, when it comes to kiddos with a trauma history or capital letter syndrome, the ability to self-regulate is absent. It's can't, not won't regulate. In simple, plain language, that means he cannot calm himself. He can't help but be overwhelmed to the point that he is either hiding under the table, flight, not responding to what you are asking of him, freeze, or running away from the situation, flight. So he can't, he's not physically able, not emotionally able. In this scenario, the adult must take the reins and help the child by co-regulating. Co-regulation helps a child develop a new pattern for stress regulation. So when it comes to co-regulation, you're simply You are being the regulator or the governor or the brain. Or for older kids, I say you're being the whiteboard. You're giving them exactly what they need to do in order to cope in that situation. So we want our kids to develop patterns for stress regulation because simply helping them in the moment or harping on the behavior is not going to help them long term. I'm going to read you this quote from Nurturing Adoptions. The early developing right brain where attachments develop is largely dominant during the first three years of life. It contains the initial initial and lasting template for stress regulation. Revisions to this template will require intentional efforts. So that's what I'm talking about. We have to be intentional. We have to have effort. We have to have a plan for our kiddos. We need to be proactive parents. So what does co-regulation look like? Okay, I'm going to use just a simple, everyday, neurotypical kiddo example. So think of a two-year-old being tired and falling on the floor and having a meltdown because she doesn't want to take a nap. Clearly, she needs one. So mom takes control of the situation. Mom takes the little one to her room and reads her a story and rocks her to sleep. And then the little one takes a nap. Mom is co-regulating because unless you have a rare toddler, she's not going to recognize her own need for a nap and put herself down for one. So that's like a simple neurotypical example. But often what we adoptive parents are doing or foster parents or kiddos with capital letter syndromes, we're filling in the gaps of missed co-regulation. Because normally when a child is an infant, the parents are doing this co-regulation all the time. So a child is, you know, crying and you pick up the baby and you hold them against you and you're regulating for them. You know, you're making them feel safe. I'm here. I'm helping you. You change their diaper. You have this schedule where you're feeding them every so many hours and you're making sure that you're ticking all the boxes of what they need. You're proactive parenting. And you're also learning their signals and you're attaching to them. You're going through the attachment cycle over and over and over again. So the child, the attachment cycle is very simple. The child expresses a need. The caregiver meets the need. Okay? So the way that an infant expresses a need is, you know, crying or screaming or You know that they look uncomfortable, and so then you meet that need. And you do this over and over again. But what happens is when the attachment cycle is broken in some of these kiddos because of neurodivergency, their brain not computing. I've talked about a lot of times, like it's like they have these loose wires. And I can attest to that myself, having loose wires in my brain that don't connect to the right You know, you've got the if-then statements and computer 
science where if X is this, then this. And I remember writing programming when I was in college. Obviously, I changed my major. But you had all of those statements of code, if this, then this. Well, these kiddos who are lacking in that attachment or have neurodivergent brains, then the if-then doesn't connect with the statement at the end. It's just this loose, half of the statement's missing. Half of the code is missing. So we have to go back and fill in these gaps of co-regulation and attachment. Because co-regulation is a huge part of attachment because it is co-regulating. It's meeting the need. The need is met. The child is, you know, they, they feel safe because their need is met. And then the cycle just keeps continuing. So I'm going to use another example with these kiddos. No matter what their age and size, we must co-regulate when they cannot regulate. A 12-year-old who cannot recognize his body signals to eat or drink must be provided with a snack and water every two hours or he will enter the flight, fight, fawn, or freeze zone. Now, my daughter and I were talking about this. You know, we used to hear in my day, when my kids were younger, we would hear from the pediatrician if a child went on a I'm not eating strike. Oh, you know, they'll eventually get hungry enough that they'll eat anything. Well, with kids who are neurodivergent or have a capital letter syndrome, that is not true. Some of these kiddos will not. They will not say, I'm hungry, because they do not recognize their body signals. And often that's because of the amygdala being stuck on and there are high levels of cortisol going through their system And think about a time that you were really stressed. Like when I'm really stressed, I do not want to eat. And just so this is going to be perfectly honest here, when I'm getting ready to go teach or present a workshop, I cannot eat beforehand. I have to wait until after. There's no way I could put something in my mouth. I just can't do it. And and that's okay. I know to eat afterward. But these kiddos, some of them will not eat. They just won't. And then what happens, my daughter and I were talking about this, then you're stuck in the cycle of the kiddo melting down throughout the day over and over and over and over again. And you're trying to fix the behavior. Maybe you have a behavior chart or a checklist or all of these things. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't try those things. Well, I don't, behavior charts don't work with these kids. I'm not saying that you don't have a plan. Like, use the instead of tips. I I highly believe that those are effective. But at the same time, if the child is mildly dehydrated and they're hungry, their body doesn't have the nutrients it needs to do what they need to do just to survive, then yeah, they're going to be melting down and melting down and melting down. So... We have to step in and co-regulate by saying, oh my goodness, it's two, it's been two hours. You need to drink some out of your water bottle, have an apple and some peanut butter. Let's keep these snacks coming. Okay? All right, another example. A nine-year-old who has sensory processing issues may lose the ability to voice his need to escape the noise and overstimulation of a loud birthday party, or going to a play, uh, or going to a movie, or any of those things, or even going to a fun family night at church may be overstimulating, or a relative's house where there's a lot of family, and they're all catching up, and they're all Asking your child to recite the states and capitals or, you know, something like that. I'm thinking about some examples from my own life when the family would get together. And because I homeschooled, it was like, you got to quiz my kids for some reason. I didn't need to quiz your kids, but you had to quiz my kids. Okay, so mom and dad or caregiver, you have to be watching for cues and either leave the event early or take the child to a quieter place. 
I, when my grandkiddos are here, there's sometimes a while I will just tell a child, you know, you can go in my bedroom. And sometimes they've gotten used to that. They will ask me, Nini, can I go in your room? Because the main part of my house is just like this one huge open room. Everything is connected. The kitchen is open to the family room, is open to the library. It's like it's all open. So sometimes there's no way to get away to a quiet place. So my bedroom has become the quiet place. So it's okay. You know what? One of the things I think about is we parents are so pressured sometimes by family, sometimes by the culture or the school. And a lot of times it's not intentional pressure by them. It's just that this is the way it's always been. So we bend and give in to, you have to stay at the party, or you have to talk to Aunt Agnes, go recite your multiplication tables, or yes, you have to go to this church event because everybody's going to be there and we're part of the church body, or whatever it is. But we have to step back and think of what's best for our children and ultimately our family because when you get home from one of those events and it takes your child days to recover, then you're not teaching them the proper coping mechanisms or regulation skills for them in the future. And one thing I learned from the book On the Spectrum He talks about counting the cost. Count the cost of what it's going to take for your child to do this or you to do this or your whole family to do this. How long are you going to be paying for it? Are you banking on energy for the next two or three days that is going to be so depleted in order to refresh it? You can't function for those days or your child can't learn anything at school for those days or they can't go to their sporting events or anything because you did that one thing where they were so dysregulated, it just drained them. And it was using, it's like a credit card. You're using energy you don't have, so you're going to have to pay it back over the next few days. Okay. Here's something important to remember. That a child with a trauma history is often emotionally half their physical age, sometimes more. And also in the adoption world, we have to consider family age. So if you adopt a 12-year-old and he's 14, he's got two years of family age. So our expectations of what they should be able to regulate or understand or family dynamics or family, for lack of a better word, rules, how things work in a family. He's only got two years there. So we're going to have to lower our expectations and expect to regulate or co-regulate a lot more than our peers that have neurotypical children without trauma histories. But the good news is, If you're like, oh my gosh, this is all so true and it's all happening. You're like, where's the good news? Well, I always have good news. As we connect and co-regulate, we change the brain chemistry, the wiring and development. It's like for years in brain science, people thought that, you know, once your brain fired these synopsis and things connected... Like in the computer science thing, if then, then this, it was always that way. But that's not true. We have found that that, there's more to it. That scientists tell us that relationships and experiences shape the brain. So think of a developing brain like a multi-storied house under construction. At birth, the downstairs brain is developed. This is the part that tells the child when to breathe, keeps the functions of the body on track. This is also where survival mode resides. The fight, flight, freeze, fawn, those mechanisms. The upstairs brain is higher functions of the brain. It is more sophisticated and houses reasoning, speech, regulation of emotions, the ability to be flexible and adaptable, and trauma skews the wiring of the brain, which we already said. 
I'm just reminding you, trauma triggers the amygdala, the watchdog of the brain. And if the brain stays stuck in the state for too long, it rewires to stay stuck in survival mode, fight, flight, fawn, or freeze. And also, chronic stress takes a heavy toll on the prefrontal cortex, and it is involved in impulses, aggression, anxiety, decision, changing gears, and self-regulation. So at this point, you might be thinking, I thought you said there was hope, Kathleen. (laughs) I thought you said there was hope. Where's the hope? There is. So the Hebbian Hebbian Principle says, what fires together, wires together. And in simple terms, what that means is the more you experience something, the more your wires are going to connect in that direction. So how do we rewire a child's brain that is stuck in the survival mode with co-regulation and fresh new experiences that show him he can trust us? We call this felt safety. And if you missed that, I have two podcasts on felt safety, one for the child and one for the parent, explaining it and giving you tips on felt safety. So when a child feels safe, his adrenals calm, he produces less cortisol, and he is able to function in his upstairs brain. Okay, finally getting to the three tips here at the end. (laughs) If you are parenting a child or a teen with a trauma history or capital letter syndrome, number one, and I've already mentioned this, but this is an important tip, Expect to co-regulate a lot more than your peers who are raising neurotypical children or children without capital letter syndromes, without trauma histories. Don't base your expectation on whether you need to help them regulate on their physical age and or size. Many children who do not have early experiences of proper care also lack proper physiological, and emotional regulation. This is because both of these regulation systems are developed through an an attachment relationship. That's from Nurturing Adoptions, and we talked about that attachment just a little bit ago. So number two, make sure your children feel safe. It's not about really being safe. You know, when you tell your kiddos, You know, the doors are locked, the windows are locked, you know, you're safe, or you go out in public and you're like, I'm right here beside you, you're safe. It's not about being safe, it's about feeling safe. So if they feel safer with the light on, if they feel safer not going to the noisy event, or staying right near you at a function, comply. Don't complain. And I know that's different because I see it happen all the time. Personally, it's happened to me when you're at a function and all your friends are there and it's like you just want the kiddos to go play so you can talk to the adults. If your child feels safer staying next to you, and I have found what happens is if you allow that child to stay near you, they're eventually going to get to the point where they feel safer six feet from you, then 10 feet from you, then 12 feet from you. Maybe not at one function, but over time, you're investing. That's the investment parenting of this. Everything that I'm talking about, you're investing in your child. You're investing in co-regulation. You're investing your time and helping your child feel safe and cope. And then the third Point is keep the positive connecting experiences coming. Keep them coming. It's like your full time job right now. The brain is also experience expectant. We come hardwired for connection, for eye contact. And just, I know not every kid likes eye contact, but if you can't do the eye contact, you can do the shoulder to shoulder. And you don't even have to touch a shoulder because some kids really freak out. But being close to them, playful interactions, and co-regulation. 
These kids need their emotional tank filled often, but that helps their brain rewire often. And I've been there. We do this reactive parenting where we get up and we're like, okay, everything's going really well so far. So I'm just going to go do these things or I have this meeting or, and then the next thing you know, your kids are melting down. And you're like, wait a minute, everything was great. We had breakfast together. We did all the things. We brushed their teeth. But we're not taking that time to fill our kids' emotional tank. And I'll give you a personal example. My youngest son took me a while to figure this out. But whenever he got up in the morning, it didn't matter if he got up early or he got up late and we were in a hurry. He needed to have a conversation like a brain dump with me. And he would walk around the island in the kitchen probably a hundred times and talk and talk and talk. And then he was ready to do whatever we were doing that day. And because I homeschooled, it was off in school. And in my brain, I'm thinking, all right, let's skip the conversation today because we need to get this started. You need to do your math because we have a practice later. We've got to go to swim team and all of these things that my brain was thinking. But if I skipped that, then his emotional tank was not full. That was him filling his emotional tank by me listening to him and giving him just feedback like, yeah, that's that's awesome or whatever it was, whatever he was talking about, whether it was a story he was writing or something that happened the day before that he was still processing. He just needed that time. So we have to figure out how to fill our kiddos' emotional tanks, and we need to do it beforehand. Because think about this. Think of it this way. I like to use practical stories to show what I'm talking about. If you went out to your car right now, and it's on empty, or it's almost on empty, and you're like, well, I only have to go 100 miles today. I'm going to drive it anyway. I'm just going to wing it. I'm just going to do it. You would never do that. Even if you have a hybrid, you would not do that. But we often do that with our kids. Instead of being proactive, we're being reactive because we're not thinking about filling their emotional tank. We're not thinking about taking them to the little emotional gas station and filling that with whatever they need. And that's why it's called investment parenting. It's because it is an investment of your time, of your energy, of your emotion, but it will pay off in the end. It will. And I'm not saying today. I know we're, we're so conditioned to everything is instant. You know, drink this powder and you'll lose weight or, you know, all of these claims that we hear or you go through the drive through and you instantly get food. This is not instant. This in investment. Look at your portfolio of their whole life. Like 10 years from now, this investment parenting will matter in a good way. Okay, so I just have some practical suggestions that I've written down, like blow bubbles, ride bikes together. That's one of the things that I did, especially with my boys, and I still do sometimes with some of my girls, is like, go to the trail, hike together, take your bikes to the trail. And whenever they're swimming, I do this all the time now with my grandkiddos. When they're swimming, I take them to the pool. I get in. I chase them around. I play games with them. It's just take that time to invest in positive experiences often. And I know I'm not judging anybody. This is very common. When you take your kiddo to the pool or, or the beach or the playground the temptation is to sit there with your phone because you're like, this is a break for me. Well, maybe you need that break, but maybe you get up for 10 or 15 of those minutes and push your child on the swing and sing. We're really famous for that in our family. We, we swing and sing. So do those kinds of things for a period of time to fill their emotional tank. And then now you go down the slide by yourself. And if you are filling in the gaps of missed co-regulation, an older teen may still want you to, to watch them jump on the trampoline, ride bikes with them, play board games, or watch movies. 
Many teens with trauma histories may have no interest in what their peers are doing and want to hang out with mom and dad. And I have personal experience with that too. Some of my kids did that for a while. It's like their 16-year-old peers are all going to go hang out and go do things. And they're like, hey, could we watch a movie to- together tonight? That's okay. That's normal. You know, connect with them. Fill in the gaps of that missed co-regulation. So um, if your child is struggling with regulation, think about these points and start applying them and start investing in your kiddo. And I promise you it will pay off in the end, but the end doesn't mean tomorrow. And that's one of the things that's. I'm just going to be honest, is very difficult when you are raising kids with capital letter syndromes and trauma histories is that it's very hard work and it's emotionally and physically challenging. But if we don't invest now, today, then the meltdowns, the frequency of them and severity of them increases, then we have to go back to ground zero. And I'm not talking about regression. We We all have seasons of regression. I'm just talking about waiting until it's too difficult. I have so many parents, they don't come to me and ask for help until their house is on fire, so to speak. Don't do that. So let me encourage you today. These are simple things you can do, even if you can just do one of those today and start working on it regularly, you will see progress in your kiddo. There is hope. So thanks for joining me today, and I will see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to Trauma-Informed Parenting. Make sure you subscribe on TraumaInformedParenting.com to receive a free resource and receive a newsletter plus updates when books or new courses are released. Also, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Podomatic, or Spotify and leave a review so other listeners can find trauma-informed parenting and know the value of the show. You're welcome to send me an email to contact at trauma-informed parenting.com.